Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for attending our session, Teaching Your College Students Powerful Soft Skills, Diplomacy and Self-Preservation. My name is Megan Taylor, and I'm a third year doctoral student at the University of North Texas studying performing arts health. And I formerly studied with um, Elena McLaren at Northwestern State University of Louisiana. And I am Elena McLaren. I've been teaching at Northwestern State University in Natchitoches, Louisiana for 17 years now. Um, and uh, it just and was <laughs> and had Megan as a graduate student. <laughs> so, um, and actually, in her time here was was really where the idea for this topic started. Uh, while she was here, she was able to. I don't know if it was a privilege, but she was able to watch me um, have to navigate situations. I was department chair at the time, um, so I was also writing the NASM self study and uh, organizing the visits and all the things that go with that. Um, I was also in the middle of getting everything ready to apply for full professor. So trying to keep my clarinet professor uh, things had going just as actively as I had been before I was department chair. Um, so needless to say, that required a whole lot of situations where she got a front row seat um, on how I handled those things. So, And since then, I've had the, the opportunity to uh, not only learn more from Dr. McLaren as my mentor on these things, but also just employ some self uh, preservation and diplomacy tactics of my own. So I'm excited to share my experiences with you um, from the student perspective as well. Uh, I think something to mention before we kind of dive into the topic here is that um, I think it's important to keep in mind as the teacher, as the instructor, the line between counselor and instructor, and it's okay to not be both. Um, I am not a trained professional counselor, so I make that clear with my students and help them where I can. But, um, you know, we just want to keep that in mind so that as a teacher, too, we don't get ourselves in, in situations that we're not trained to handle. Um, so I think that's just something to keep in mind under this umbrella and the importance of setting boundaries and knowing uh, the resources so that you can help your students. And that's absolutely OK, too. So that you're aware of the resources on campus um, and in your community that can be helpful. So if you have a situation where you need to call in that help you can direct the student to the right resources. So I think that that's an important statement to make um, under all of the things that we're about to talk about, so. And as we begin, uh, we'll be discussing diplomacy and self-preservation because we think that they are often missed in the training of music professionals, but our experiences prove that they should be front and center. Our perspectives as a graduate student and a professor will inform this conversation and highlight how the context of private lesson instruction is ideal for working on these critical soft skills, We'll also define them, the soft skills uh, from both perspectives and then discuss potential challenges, present strategies for cultivating sustainability in the music profession rather than burnout. And again, just uh, we wanna make sure that, you know, we are sharing our experiences um, and our own research into these areas. Neither one of us are professional counselors or mental health professionals um, or medical professionals. So that what we're talking about today should not be taken as a substitute for medical advice, just simply our perspectives. Which leads us right into the first topic on uh, diplomacy. Um, so I think this is something that we use quite a bit and don't realize uh, that we use it. Um, we realize when it's not being used because that's usually <laughs> when we become very aware of its need to be used. Uh, I think it's defined as the art of dealing with people in a sensitive and effective way, which is a really great description. Um, as I introduced it to Megan when she was a graduate student, it's, I call it how to get what you need without pissing people off. Um, so <laughs> however you wanna view it is fine. Um, there's several ways of communicating with people. We have to keep that in mind. So we've, we uh, are talking about written communication. Um, and this includes social media, of course. You want to always keep that in mind. That's uh, something new for anyone of my generation. We didn't grow up with that. So I think it's important to address when you're teaching students. Um, spoken communication. We do that all the time. Um, and as, as professors in meetings and juries speaking with our colleagues, administration, and our students, we've got to think about those things. Um, and the subtle communications, all of those body language things that we see uh, in person and even through virtual meetings, which is kind of a new reality for all of us. Um, so we want to keep all of those forms of communication in mind when we're talking about diplomacy. I think, um, you know, this comes in so many forms. Uh, emails to all of these areas we've talked about, administration, students, peers, um, conversations, juries. Um, and then also um, part of the communication is understanding that hierarchy, who, you're, who to speak to when. So I think we're gonna talk a little bit more about that later, but I think that should be included under communications, understanding um, the hierarchy of that. So 
Um, so just keep all of those things in mind as we kind of generally talk about communication, we're talking about all of those things. And from the student perspective, just keeping in mind that the first impressions are important for everyone, but especially as a student, that very first email you send to a potential clarinet professor you'd like to study with can, can really make or break whether or not you even get a response back from that person. And also knowing that the conversations you have um, with your own colleagues and your own peers, um, those can travel around. Um, so just being aware that the, the university is, is generally small, um, at least within your department. And so know that um, you know, you might be saying some, something to someone and um, just being aware of how that could come off um, to someone who's overhearing or any other situations like that. So th those are two things to keep in mind. And then lastly, um, as a student organization and a student leader, you're not only representing yourself, but you're also representing the university and then your own club or organization. So keeping that role in mind as well as we move forward in this conversation. So setting the stage for how we um, want to suggest that you approach just generally communicating with uh, people in your, in your academic institution or even outside of it. Um, so set the tone. We were looking for something that's somewhat formal, but also friendly and respectful. And then using a direct and clear language. Um, I like to start most of my communications, especially written communications by using the, the title of the professor or using professor when, when in doubt. And then also using a greeting, even something as simple as um, good morning or um, hope you're doing well in these uncertain times as we have been um, probably overusing in this, during this pandemic season. Um, also along with being direct, being concise, respecting people's time that you're communicating and, and clearly stating what it is that you're asking of them um, upfront in the email or in a spoken conversation. Also be sure to proofread and uh, rehearse your conversations ahead of time, especially if you're worried about the conversation, um, bringing up any, any tensions. It, it can also be helpful to have a little notebook where you write down um, you know, your asks or your points you'd like to, to make with the person you're talking to. So you can, you can stay on track and make sure that you've addressed everything that you're wanting to with that person. So you don't have to make a second meeting with them to follow up on something that you forgot about. Then actively listen when you are in the conversation. Don't be thinking about what you'd like to respond back to them right away. Take in what they're saying, make eye contact, um, nod along if you'd like to, and then respond versus reacting to what they're saying. That can also be um, you know, a good thing to keep in mind as we move forward in conversations with folks. And then lastly, after a conversation, make sure you document outcomes. So provide your, um, the person you've contacted with a nice thank you for your time, a little written follow-up about what you discussed in the conversation, and then highlight any, any directions or points that you'd like to make about going forward with working with that person. Absolutely, and I think true both for student and professor, all of those uh, setting, setting the tone um, and setting the stage as you move through any communication with anyone. Uh, invariably, we're going to have challenges to these. Uh, it doesn't always work as perfectly as we would like, even when we do everything right. Um, and it's usually when these challenges present themselves that the need for diplomacy is uh, greater than ever. So <laughs> we have to remember, this is the part where the don't piss people off comes in. So <laughs> um, I think, you know, when someone responds to your communication in whatever form in a non-productive way, um, that's when you can really go back to these skills and um, almost kind of rinse and repeat so that you just remember that these, these basic skills in diplomacy can really help to move, to progress the situation instead of to make it worse. Um, I think one of the things you can do too uh, when you have these challenges to create a time boundary. So whether you have a need from someone or they're asking for something from you, um, understanding this time boundary, you can say, I'll get back to you tomorrow. Let me double check my calendar or if you need something from someone, can I please ask for this by Friday at five? I have a report to write. It's really important. I have this information. Let me know if I can help you. Those sorts of things. Um, it gives you the space to respond versus react. I have found that in that react space is where emotions come in and can create some situations that could easily be avoided if there's just a little bit of time um, and space to allow yourself and the other person to respond. Um, I think um, make sure that before you're communicating, you know yourself what your actual needs are so you can communicate those clearly and then know where you can compromise and understanding, of course, that for most situations, both sides are going to need to compromise, um, especially if they don't totally agree on something. So I think coming into the conversation with that in mind can help you to make it move productively much more quickly. Um, and then I think even from the perspective, professor perspective, 
having a trusted mentor or colleague to go to can be really invaluable, especially if we get into where emotions are starting to kick in. It's very good to have someone on the out kind of be the voice of reason and, and let you know on the outside, let you know uh, what they're seeing and, and, and a way to help you. Um, so I think, again, from the professor, you have to understand we're kind of in the middle. We need to have our own mentors and thank goodness I have those. I think everybody does. But now as a professor, you're in the position to be a mentor. And that's a very big responsibility that I think we need to be aware of and understand what being a trusted mentor means, um, because it can help tremendously um, from the from the student perspective. And I think from from the student perspective, um, creating that time boundary can be so helpful um, for you as well. I mean, I, I know for me that I've gotten into situations where I just want to say yes to everything. And then I end up, you know, three or four weeks from the end of the semester and I'm super burnt out. And I, you know, could have prevented that by taking a little bit of time and being more responding instead of reacting in conversations and saying things like, let me double check my calendar and get back to you. And so I'm avoiding putting myself on three or four back-to-back -back Zoom calls on Friday morning or something of that situation as of late. Um, also, picking a mentor that is outside of the institution is always something that, um, that you can consider, especially if you, you know, maybe you're a graduate student now and you have your mentor from your undergrad or, or someone else that's in your circle that's trusted. Having that objective person be able to tell you kind of what, is, what they think is going on and give you a perspective um, can be really helpful in navigating um, some of these challenging situations that we're kind of alluding to here. Yeah, definitely. Um, and I think the, the need to talk about diplomacy is important because it provides a framework for self-advocacy, as you're talking about, and which is also a form of self-preservation. Um, so when we're talking, Megan and I started talking about this idea, and we really, the, the term self-care didn't sit well with us because, um, now don't get me wrong, I love some self-care, chocolate, bubble baths, bring it on. Um, and those certainly have a place, so <laughs> we're not saying don't do those. But we really wanted to talk about what happens before that um, so that you don't get to a point where self-care becomes a means of survival, but actually just becomes something nice that you do for yourself because you can. Um, so, so we've settled on the term self-preservation, um, looking up some definitions, trying to figure out what exactly this means. So one of the definitions says, you know, it's thought to be the basis of rational and logical thought and behaviors. Um, this makes perfect sense if you think about other situations in our life where we use things for self-preservation, seatbelts. Uh, speed limits, um, all those sorts of things, the silly tag on the hairdryer that tells you not to put it in water. I mean, things, silly things like that, you know, but those are meant to prevent harm or prevent trauma from happening. So um, I think keeping, why not in our professional life as well? We don't have to get to the point of burnout or um, just trying to survive day to day. Uh, so that's really what we want to address. And, and for us, we see this as a proactive uh, preventing um, and so that way we're not trying to fix something. We are just in a state of being um, able to really function and thrive, which is I think what we would all like to be able to do. So, good. Um, I think the first thing, there's so much I could say about this. So I'm trying to make sure I don't over get going on a tangent, but um, knowing yourself, and this is really where you have to do a little bit of self-exploration is so important. Know what your tendencies are and, um, and just be kind of honest with, with yourself about those things. Um, workaholic, people pleaser, overachiever, procrastinator, micromanager, sensitive, those sorts of things. Um, and if you don't know, that's okay. The cool thing is there's all sorts of um, these personality tests, things like this can, that can help you kind of identify those tendencies within yourself. Most of us know what these are for us, but in looking through some of those resources, you may discover some areas where you didn't realize you had a tendency. Um, and I think equally important is knowing the tendencies of those people that you interact with um, that can really help you to communicate effectively is to really understand. And this is something where, you know, I think in those personality tests, you can also just learn what the tendencies are so that you can, you know, it's not like you're trying to define people or put them in a box, but it really can help you to understand how to communicate with different types of personalities. Um, and remember that it's not your responsibility to change people. <laughs> You're only responsible for yourself. So I think a lot of frustration comes in wishing that someone would communicate differently. Uh, that does not help the situation to wish that someone would do something you want them to do. So it helps you just kind of move into that acceptance level and um, learn how to communicate with them and to honor that that is how they, those are their tendencies. And so it helps you to just move forward with that. Um, and then of course, practicing diplomacy, the things that we've, that we've talked about. I wanna say something really quick, Megan, about the documentation that you mentioned, which I think is so important. Um, I think 
it can really help you to set the stage for self-preservation in a way that um, you're providing a framework that down the road um, just makes things work more smoothly. So simple things, of course, on the nice end of things, thank you notes, uh, even handwritten thank you notes are great sometimes. Um, but more importantly, as a way to document meetings when they went well and when they didn't go so well, um, if you have a situation that isn't going as, as well as you would like it, I think it's great to put it in an, in an email and, you know, very professionally just document. Um, I just want to, you know, communicate these things for you. Can you help me with these things? Can we find a way to compromise on these things? And then you've got a, a documentation to go back to if things aren't going well, in case you do need to go up the chain of command and ask for help from above, you've got it documented and the ways that you've already tried to solve the, the situation. Um, and I think just understanding that from a student and a professor perspective uh, can really help you and to go back and look at what the communication was so that you don't misspeak in a situation. Um, I just want to add that to your documentation comment because I think that's just really important. Um, it'll also help you to know where to choose your battles, <laughs> which is such an important skill. Um, we don't want to die on every hill. Um, and so understanding again what's important to you and where you can compromise can help you to choose those battles. And I have found in helping students, that's something I've been able to, I've actually been presented with the opportunity to uh, quite often teach students, um, help guide them on how to do this, how to choose their battles. Uh, I think that's that's really important. And as a student, um, back to the chain of command in academia, often, you know, you don't know what that is right away. And so um, when you come into a situation where you need to address something, first ask what the chain of command is, ask your major professor or someone that is close to you who you should talk to about something. And I do say this with a grain of salt. Um, there are gonna be times where you can't go to that person or can't go to a certain person um, that you would need to. So subverting the chain of command is appropriate in some situations, but for the most part, trusting that once you have filed your documentation with the appropriate person, that it will take time. Um, it could take time, but it will be resolved and it's being looked into um, and taken seriously. And then being able to follow up with that, you know, in a few weeks or however long that it takes and just knowing that um, that is the situation um, the academia just moves a little slower than you might think on the outside because you don't know what everyone is uh, responsible for moving forward. And you're going to get a much quicker answer and a more helpful answer in at least trying to understand that, you know, um, knowing that emailing the chain of command does not work like texting. You know, you can't do that in the middle of the night. You can't, you know? um, and I think just understanding that that it's just a completely different process. Uh, and if the communication is professional and diplomatic, then the framework was there for much better communication just with the entire process, um, rather than the person above you having to navigate through an undiplomatic process to get the answer to you. Um, that just really slows things down sometimes, you know. So, you know, that also kind of leads to the next thing I wanted to mention was this um, understanding the, uh, the hierarchy and that things in academia work sometimes a way that you're not aware of is just this idea of acceptance and awareness um, can actually save a lot of frustration uh, down the road. Um, none of us understand everybody's job, nor do we understand what everybody's dealing with that day. And so I know for us, um, and I speak for myself too, when we've got something on our mind and we want to get something done, it is the most important thing to me at that time, but that doesn't mean it's the most important thing to everybody else that I'm talking to. Uh, we just don't know what's going on. So I think just knowing that sometimes you have to accept that it will take time and that, you know, just to be aware of that can really help um, along the way. And then to accept that you don't control everything as much as we'd like to sometimes. <laughs> We can't make things work faster just because we want them to, or we can't make things go a certain way. So understanding what you can control and affecting that versus being frustrated over what you can't control and complaining about that, um, that can make or break your own self-preservation, quite honestly. Um, and then using these things together, the strategies we've talked about already, they really go hand in hand. And, and if you're doing those for yourself as the professor, then you really are able to help your students more with that. Um, and so, and then as the student goes through that, then they also, well, they see you doing it and, and you can really help them to navigate that and understand where to, where they can accept things and, and, um, and where they need to be aware of things. So, you know, I think that's okay. Um, I think too, you know, to be a vehicle for change, a lot of times, both students and professors, you know, we, we want to do good and we want to make things better and that's fantastic. And that's something we want. 
But in order to be a vehicle for change, you, we've got to learn to work within the system. We've got to learn the system the best that we can. Uh, we need to respect the input we're receiving and the reasons why, even if we don't like them um, or agree with them, they are there for a reason. Um, and then that'll help us to create solutions where, where we can compromise. Everybody has to compromise for a solution. So if you come to a problem with some solutions in mind, I have found it works so much more quickly and you get such a better response uh, in, in that way. I think sometimes the passion for wanting to change something is very good, but the means that people do that are not as productive as they can be, especially in academia where we just have to understand sometimes things work the way they work and to change the entire system overnight is very likely not going to happen. So. Um, yeah. Did you have anything to comment on in that from the student perspective? Yeah, I think that recognizing that that these situations, um, I know that we're talking about, they they might seem obvious for some and maybe not for others. But as you move from being a professional or sorry, a student to being a professional, employing these things is going to be a lot um, more prevalent in your your daily life. And so taking these seriously as you're a student and you're being exposed to these situations from the, the professor's perspective um, taking a mental note of how their your professor is handling that, um, good or bad, and being able to respond in the future based on that. Well, it's something that um, I, at least me personally, I have taken a lot of of things from Dr. McLaren and been able to employ them in my in my own life now, and I've been really grateful for that. So I, I just want to say that you know this is um, an important topic, and um, I think it's very valuable for students to learn this. You know, kind of when they're still in that student perspective, because that that mentor is right there. Yeah, and I think many of us learn it on the job um, or don't. <laughs> and so, yeah. and that's why we're talking about this now. <laughs> um, so I think understanding that sooner and, and as professors understanding that we can teach some of these things and at least prepare our students for these um, can really make um, the culture of our profession really be a positive one moving forward, um, yeah. which, you know, um, you know, I think for as professors, for us to remember, you know, kind of figuring out, okay, how do we do this now? This all sounds great. How do we achieve this with our students? Um, a lot of it, I think most of us are already doing and don't realize how effective it is. Just modeling these behaviors and modeling how to handle these things um, is so important. Uh, talking about them, encouraging students, teaching them about these situations, studio classes, private lessons, private conversations, um, using resources to help students, how to write an email, how to communicate with their peers, how to communicate when you're doing rehearsals, how to set those things up uh, professionally. There's a lot of opportunities for us to, to guide students through these things. Um, it's okay to teach these basic skills. I think we as professors need to not assume that students come into college with these basic skills intact. People come from all sorts of different backgrounds where they've gotten different skills. So it's okay to talk about these and really important actually. Um, it's also okay to correct and guide students. And I think if we do it from a place of mutual respect and really truly wanting to help the student, it will be received in that manner of um, just doing some course correcting where I needed. Okay, here's a different way that you might want to do that. Um, you might, you know, okay, why wasn't that effective? Let's look at it. You know, maybe someone's got, you know, it was off putting the way that you did this, or I see what you were trying to say. Here's a better way to say that so they understand your tone a little bit better, you know. Um, and then remembering too is that our undergraduate students versus graduate students, those are very different times in a student's life. So we have to be smart about what we're communicating when and, and how, to, how to go about that and what we're training them for, um, you know, where, where they're going to next. I think under self-preservation as the professor, we have to be careful to set boundaries too. I know sometimes I wanna help people so much that it's very easy for me to give away all of my free time. So I've learned that lesson several times in my professional life of how to, to set those time boundaries for myself when I'm available, when I can be helpful um, uh, and not to overextend myself and that it's okay to set those boundaries. And I have gotten good response from students when I just set those boundaries, they understand. Um, and then again, the responsibility of being a mentor, being a trusted mentor, being open to questions, um, letting students know that there are no dumb questions. They, you're, it's you, and I always tell students, it's my responsibility to teach you these things. Please ask me if you don't know, I will help you through it. I'd much rather you ask me a question that seems like you should know it than find out the hard way down the road. Let's just talk about it, you know, so. And that's where finding someone who's willing to share about these experiences is so important. I know in our work together, that, that level of disclosure on, hey, this is a situation I'm dealing with right now. And like, here's the details that you as a student can know. And here's, you know, I know things that you, that there are things that you can't know, but on a high level, this is how I'm responding to it. Those kinds of conversations have been really beneficial to me to now 
when I'm in those situations as a, a you know emerging professional, I'm able to kind of draw on that experience directly and execute um, you know a lot more dip- diplomatically than I would have if we had not sat down and had some of those conversations. So it's been really helpful. And I would just say when your professor is willing to share with you, um, keep that person around so that you can uh, kind of you know still keep them as a mentor even after you graduate and take these conversations really seriously because they will come up no matter if you stay in academia or if you go into another industry. Yeah. Yeah. Just, yeah, life in general. And they come up continually as a professor too. So I'm so thankful for the mentors I've been able to keep throughout my, um, my life actually, and just my professional career and and beyond. So um, I think we've been talking about resources. And so that's something we want to provide for everyone here. So there's a QR code you'll be able to scan, which will lead you to a uh, living document, basically, we are adding to this continually um, to help you provide, at least share with you the resources we have found in, in these areas. There are a ton out there. Uh, where this is certainly not comprehensive. This is just what we have found for ourselves and are happy to share with you. Um, so just kind of look for that. And um, we're just really appreciative for everyone for listening and, and for being interested in this topic. Um, our emails are also there. So please feel free to email either one of us with any questions. And um, hopefully in the future, we can uh, present this as more of a discussion. I think it's a great topic and uh, something that can really be uh, helpful for everyone as we move forward in our, in this, in our profession. Yeah. Thank you so much for coming.